Welcome everyone to the Loan Officer Training Series with the Mortgage Calculator. We'll wait just a few minutes to get started here. In the meantime, we put the comments up on the screen. You can pop your comments in there as we wait to get started. I see a lot of people are already in there commenting. Thank you all for being early. We are live on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. So give us just a minute here to get live on all the different platforms and then we will get started. Appreciate everybody tuning in. Hope everybody's been having a good week. We have a very basic fundamental topic here for today that I'm excited to go through. Definitely something that all loan officers need to know and be very aware of. And it looks like we are live on all the different platforms, so we are good to go. <clears throat> we'll go ahead and take the chat off the screen there so we can get into it. So <clears throat> welcome, everyone. My name is Kyle Hershey. I am the COO of The Mortgage Calculator, joined here by our president, Nick Hershey. And what we do every Tuesday and Wednesday night at 7 p.m. Eastern time is a loan officer training on a different topic. Today's topic is something which, again, should be very familiar to all loan officers, which are the Fannie Mae guidelines. Now, obviously, we can't read the entire guidelines right now, but definitely want to point some things out and just stress the importance of this as well. So I know Nick has them pulled up so we can screen share a little bit here and talk about the different Fannie Mae guidelines. And remember that here at the Mortgage Calculator, when something doesn't fall into the Fannie Mae guidelines, that's where we shine as well with our non-QM products, right? So we always want to know the Fannie Mae guidelines, check the Fannie Mae guidelines, because most of the time a conventional loan is going to be the cheapest option. And so we're always going to check the Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac guidelines and Freddie Mac's guidelines are tomorrow's training. So we're always going to check Fannie and Freddie to see if the loan can qualify for those because it's typically the cheapest option. But when it falls outside that box, also falls outside FHA and VA, that is where we, in USDA, I guess I should say, that is where we shine at the mortgage calculator with our 5,000 other products with alternative income and documentation. So with that being said, I'll go ahead and hand it over to Nick here. Nick, you can go ahead and share your screen and let's talk about the ever so important Fannie Mae guidelines. Thank you, sir. Yes, we definitely need to know this. This is our Bible as a loan officer. This is our guide. And uh, what Kyle said was very important. If we're going to go non-QM, which is where we really specialize, you have to know what Fannie Mae is so you know when it isn't going to fit, right? So there is no, I only do conventional. There is no, I only do non-QM. You got to know both to do both, really. Uh, There is no way around it. And uh, all the programs are generally, just keep in mind, even if you're in non-QM or even in commercial, even uh, if the guideline's not written, it's generally going to refer to Fannie Mae. So just keep in mind uh, that not only are these, you know, our kind of go-to, but they're every other lender investor down the line. uh, It's their go-to as well. Uh, So remember, we'll, we'll get some investors with, you know, eight pages of guides instead of thousands and you're like how does this work well the other thousands are fannie mae they have the eight pages that differ of where they differ from fannie mae uh typically uh so it's very important to understand in in general sense that we have to know what we have to know what we don't have right And, and, and vice versa so let me go ahead and switch my screen i'm gonna have to take the graphic off i can't uh show two graphics at once give me one second And I'm going to full screen this. All right. So there's nothing secret about Fannie Mae. Anybody can come here. I even like sending links to my customers to Fannie Mae, right? 
rather than argue with my customer about why we have to do something, say, well, here is the actual rule written. It's public. You know, you can see it. I can see it. Everybody can see it. Uh, you know, makes it a short conversation rather than trying to, um, you know, fight something. We're just uh, educating. So uh, very simple. This is the site. Let me go ahead and drop it in the chat <clears throat> on all our platforms. Let's see. I'll drop it in the YouTube. It's selling-guide.fannymay.com. Oh, I don't think I can drop it in the LinkedIn. Maybe Kyle can do that while I'm talking. You can try to go to my LinkedIn and drop it. Uh, a little under the weather today, but uh, I'll uh, try to walk through this. So uh, selling guide dot here, I can bring this down too. selling guide dash guide dot Fannie Mae dot com. Very simple. This is the site we're on. Actually, let me zoom in just a tad too, because I know it's hard for you guys to see. That's probably too much. I think that's as big as we can get. All right, let me full screen it again. All right, so we're just going to go through the selling guide in general. I don't have a presentation here, guys. There's no slides. We're actually live on the website right now. So please follow along here. Uh, as Kyle likes to say, one of uh, the stories uh, I like to say is when I first got a job at the bank, uh, you know, there was no training of any kind. That's why we love to train, right? That's why we love to do these things. You know, you get a job at the bank, you can say, what do I do? They say, oh, you got to know what to do. Like, well, where do I... What do I, you know, where's the guide? What do I, how do I, where's, what do I do? Where's my employee guide or whatever, right? Uh, and there really isn't one at a bank, right? So uh, one day uh, when I was trying to figure out what to do, uh, you know, Jose said, well, have you, you know, you got to read the selling guide. And I was like, well, oh, there's a guide. So that's our guide. And uh, he explained that, yes, this is the guide for all conventional loans. And you can actually click this button to download the guide. So definitely, well, let me try to exit this. Uh, definitely download it. It's a thousand pages. We don't need to read the full thing though. So definitely download it, print it. Uh, but let's go through the pages that matter. So once we pulled it up, you know, uh, I was able to find the parts that matter, and I was able to read this. Hungry for information on my first day, uh, trying to help do the loans at the bank. So how do we do it? And it's pretty simple. There's actually a written guide. You know, for a couple of days, I struggled asking the branch manager where the guide is. And they had nothing, not one document existed to train anybody on anything. Um, but luckily, Fannie Mae does it all for us. So we're going to focus in here, guys, on part B, origination through closing is going to have all of our rules. So you don't have to read all thousand pages. That's going to have all kinds of stuff you don't need to worry about. Uh, this this actual uh, PDF is the full we're just doing part B. Notice it breaks it down into, uh, you know, kind of outline type setup here. We're not going to do QC. That's for our QC uh, departments. We're not selling, securitizing, delivering. We don't sell direct to Fannie ourselves. Neither do any of our loan officers, obviously. So that's not anything we got to worry about. We really got to focus on B1, B2, B3, B4. Uh, and of course, B5 and some of these other ones. But uh, really, this is the meat of what we're doing. It's not as complicated as you guys might think. So this just tells us the loan app. We don't need to waste uh, time on that today. That's kind of the basics. Eligibility. This is where we start getting into the nitty gritty. So look at all these sub chapters where they'll have one, two, five, ten paragraphs to read through. So just look. Let's just go through the outline in general. A lot of different stuff. Then we get to B3. That wasn't a ton, right? If you break it down into an outline, it's not a lot. You can chunk this up. B3 is underwriting. So this is where we get into uh, all the DU stuff, what approve eligible means. Uh, luckily, they do this all automated for us, but there's a lot of stuff within here. Then we have how to do income, commission income, verbal verification of employment, exactly what you have to do, rental income, how to do that. Notice there's a chapter for everything here. Business structures, how the different business structures work. So all these different things, S Corp, C Corp, LLC, 1065, 1040 Schedule F, 1040 Schedule E, 1040 Schedule D. Everything you guys ever wanted to know is right here. Let's see, virtual currency, that's a new one, huh? Yeah, look, it just got released in 2022. A lot of updates get updated too. Look at the dates on these guys. 
a lot of new updates since COVID. A lot of stuff here. We keep scrolling through credit, ages of credit, credit, DU credit, debt to income, monthly obligation. So that's all debts. Boom. Now we get to property. Now we're talking appraisals. How do we get in here? What do we got to do for appraisal selection? What do we got to do for desktop hybrid? How old can appraisals be? All the questions you guys need to ask are all right here. Condos, very important. Mixed use. People ask about mixed use all the time. We can do it in certain very, 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 very specific cases, which are going to be outlined right here. Uh, ineligible property is very important chapter to read, right? Make sure you go through all of these. Now we get to unique underwriting. So these are things where we have the high balance thing, manufactured. This is all specialty stuff, manufactured homes, uh, construction to perm. That's the home style as well. The renovations, uh, that's your, uh, 50 a six Texas specialty loans. Native American loans, community loans, all these specialty programs, home ready. Then we get into some government stuff. But remember, we're talking Fannie Mae here, so not much. Uh, talking a little bit about VA, RD, HUD, all that kind of stuff. Insurance, mortgage insurance requirements, title insurance requirements, exceptions, all that stuff. If you're curious about title. There's a whole package, uh, a whole section here on title. Uh, if you've never seen it or don't know what's needed, boom, very thorough guide here. Lots of great stuff. Legal documents closing. This is where we no longer have to really, uh, you know, memorize it, right? Or, or be familiar with it. Uh, I wouldn't spend too much time on this. This is good stuff to know, though, guys. You should know about the notes and uh, signatures and stuff like that. But of course, our closing experts are going to do this. So even this chapter can kind of be dropped off of your uh, required reading, I would say. So a lot of great info here. We just went through it very quickly. Now you can dig into each chapter. Let's dig into a couple. Uh, but, but first, I want to make sure you guys know you can search the guide instantly in this giant search box and you don't have to drill through like we just did. If you're trying to find rental income, you're going to type it in. It can take you right to that section or you can pose it as a question. So notice they have pose it like a question as their prompt. Uh, they kind of have a nice little system. They call it Ask Polly actually, uh, but they like it as a question. So a lot of Cool little things we can skip to. These questions are kind of guided answers. So if we skip to this, it highlights the section uh, and it guides us right to it. Now notice this is one section of the guide. And within that section, they have the intro, they have the, the uh, actual info. Some of these sections are bigger than others. Some are just one paragraph. Some are, uh, you know, a whole book uh, within the guide here. There are also announcements that make up the guidelines. So make sure you don't forget about announcements. Let's click on one of these just so we can see it together. So selling guide announcements. Uh, these are changes to the selling guide. This was on June 1st, 2022. So uh, they changed the guide, how to calculate the arm rates, some other quick changes. Obvious, oh, it tells you which, uh, which chapters included we're including this update, but lots of uh, good stuff come out in those notices. Let me click out of here, full screen this again. So always check out those notices at the end. That's where some of these updates within here have come from. So anytime you get stuck on anything, the first place you should always go, whether it's a non-QM loan or not, the best place to go to quickly check out the general guides. If you have something in general, especially like appraisal, right? All non-QM and QM, every type of loan is going to have the same property appraisal requirements, essentially. So if you have any questions on appraisal, uh, this would be a great place to search. Now let's start going into a couple of the topics that I always want you guys, uh, or at least the people on my team, I know we're doing this public, uh, but our team members to pay attention to. 
uh, which get people stuck, but are just so easy. They're just right at our fingertips. So there's no reason uh, that we should get stuck on things like this because it's, it's so easy to get unstuck here. So let's just dig through and go uh, again through the topics. Obviously, the search bar is the best thing for you guys to do. Uh, but since I don't have like a, you know, curriculum of what to search, we're just going to go through the topics here again and actually drill down through some of them. So loan application, again, we don't need to know that. Eligibility, occupancy types. Good one to know. What is a principal residence? Some people get confused on that. So this is good to know. Requirements for owner occupancy with multiple borrowers, right? Who has to live there, right? Can there be co-signers, non-occupant borrowers? Skip to the non-occupant borrower section. Good. Definitely a good section to read. Stuff about military, children providing housing for parents, right? As in parents usually when they're uh, older a lot of times, right? So a lot of uh, ins and outs here on actually what makes a primary and not, which can be more complicated than you might think. What is a second home? Second primary home, right? Make sure you check that. Notice there is no such thing as a two unit second home, right? It's a second primary home. You can't have an investment portion to it. Uh, so make sure you guys understand that and check all these boxes, right? Investment properties. What is an investment? Good to know as well. Group home. Here are all the announcements. Great chapter to read. LTVs. I would read the matrix for LTVs. So this should link to the matrix, I'm guessing. Hopefully it links to the matrix. Yeah, eligibility matrix. I would definitely link, uh, link out to that. Let's that was a great, especially when we were at the bank, only doing mostly conventional. That was a great thing to have handy on my desk. Uh, yeah, I would back, print this. Back then, print know. this on your wall, guys. This is this is your go-to, the Fannie Mae matrix. This is your quick guide, and then you're going to dig into the actual selling guide. But remember, the matrix is here. Uh, we're going to use the DU11, right? So this is for Oz. So notice this is the DU version, which is different than the other versions. So make sure you check out the unit limits. Uh, remember, we absolutely love to do our non-QM because we can exceed these amounts, right? Uh, we can exceed 75 cash out on an investment. We can exceed 70 cash out on a two to four unit. We can even exceed 70 cash out on a, a five to eight unit with our DSCR stuff. So we love when our non-QM allows us to uh, go above this, but again, if you don't know this, if you don't know what the standard is, you don't know the benefits of not being standard, right? Of, of going non-QM and where we really shine. So it's important to, as Kyle said, just because you want to do non-QM, which I know a lot of you love to work with us because of uh, that you know what we're going up against, right? Hey, Nick, can you zoom out a little bit on this just so you can get the zoom. most of the page? Zoom out a little bit. Zoom out. Oh, okay. I guess you can zoom in one more maybe, but just the point that it's just, it's easier to see, there you go, as look at one page and you can easily see, okay, are we doing a cash out? How many units is it? This is the LTV we can do or the prime. I mean, it's super easy. That's what I would have printed at my desk when we were at the bank and we had no non-QM options. This was it, mm -hmm. you know, that was it. And this is for home style, manufactured, home ready with DU, right? So with a DU approval. So it's not telling us, remember, it's not telling us the uh, DTI limits because there is no DTI limits. If DU says yes, it's yes. But we know the DTI limits for DU is anything under 50. Um, but it's not going to tell us specifically. It's just saying, hey, just stay under this, right? So make sure you check that out. Now, when you guys see the DTI and stuff, remember that's manual underwriting. We don't do much of this, right? And this excludes the specialty stuff. Remember, these are all under the specialties. Standard eligibility manual. So that's this. Standard eligibility DU. There is no DTI because it's just whatever DU tells you is what DU tells you. DU is going to tell you automatically. If we're doing a manual underwrite, which we definitely don't recommend, and that's where we would go non-QM typically because we have plenty of non-QM solutions where we don't have to just guess on an underwriter. We know here's the problem. Here's the guideline that says we can solve that problem. Uh, so typically, we're going to stay over here. 
Be very careful looking at this page. We very rarely ever do a manual underwrite conventional loan. DU is a great system. Uh, we use it for a reason. And if it doesn't fit DU, we're probably going to go non-QM rather than try to do a manual underwrite and leave it up to a single human being, a single underwriter to make that decision rather than find a loan that fits the guidelines. So we probably won't use this. I know a lot of people like to look at this, um, but this will probably confuse you. Definitely recommend don't use this page. So if you're printing this on your wall, throw this page away, please. You're going to get confused. And if we go through it, this is manual for the specialty stuff. Again, throw this page away. You'll get confused. If you know exactly what you're doing and exactly why you're doing a manual, you know, you're you're definitely probably already beyond having to print this page. So uh, if you're looking for a quick guide, I would throw this page away. High LTV refinance, that's a specialty thing, not really applicable. I wouldn't worry about that. And the rest are notes, guys. So there's really only a couple important pages, which is standard DU and all the specialty, but DU, home style, manufactured, home ready. Okay. I would stay away from the manual. Now let's get back in here. Full screen again. All right. So LTVs, I would stick with the matrix. Uh, matrix, matrix, subordinate financing. Good to know when can you, when can't you. There's a whole chapter on it. If you're going to resubordinate, all that kind of good stuff, make sure you read exactly what you need, what you don't need, all that kind of good stuff. Let's see, limited cash out purchase. You definitely have to read those if you're doing those, but we won't open each one. Prohibited refinance, right? What can't you do? This is good to know. I love to look at the ineligible, right? Lender solicitation, right? They're not letting you target. So that's for lenders. That's not for you guys necessarily. Prearranged agreements, advanced payments. So these are all things that break their rules. Uh, those are more for lender type rules. Uh, let's go into like the ineligible properties when we're looking at ineligibility. Loan limits, we all know this, uh, but make sure you go to the chart. This should link to the chart, yeah. Conforming loan limits are posted on Fannie Mae's website, and then you can type in the zip code or whatever. All of our pricing systems usually pick that up, so you guys don't have to worry too much about that. But no, that's a different website. Loan eligibility. Um, this is more of like compliance type stuff, so most of our systems will run this for us, okay? And that's going to be a big chapter. So that one's going to be confusing. Definitely skim through it, though, and understand it. Do, 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 do. What are some good ones? Ah, this one gets us stuck. We love to work with investors here. Maximum or multiple finance properties, right? Limit on finance properties. A lot of people don't know this. There's a limit. You can only do a certain number of conventional loans. The big boy... Uh, big girl investors that uh, that get up there, they start to realize this. Uh, but there is no maximum number of principles because there's only one. So that makes no sense that there's no limit, but that's the case. Uh, same thing, uh, two for home ready or whatever. Second home investments, 10. So technically the maximum loans that any uh eligible borrower. So there's a whole chapter on that, right? It's not just U.S. citizens. It could be a non-U.S. You know, there's a bunch of other eligibility. Uh, but anybody that's doing conventional loans is going to be limited to 10 second homes or investments and one principal residence because you can't have two principal residents, right? So 11 is the most that you'll ever see, right? Once someone has 11 loans, they're either doing a non-QM loan or they're swapping out one of their conventional loans for a non-QM loan that they're going to refinance into. It's impossible to get DU approval if you've financed more than 10 properties, right? So very important to know there, especially for us doing a lot of investors here at the Mortgage Calculator. Just want to be clear, Nick, it's 10 at the same time. Yeah, 10 loans, 10 properties with 10 loans, right? You got You pull that credit, there's 10 loans there. The only transaction you could do after that is a primary. You can always do a primary, right? You can, That's why it says right here, no limit. So anytime you run into you on someone's new primary, so I have an investor that owns 40 properties, I can run his 
DU on his, his primary, and I can get a DU approval for a new primary. I can't run DU approval and ever get him approved for another investment property, right? So it's just never going to work on DU. So just keep that in mind. Uh, this is just defines it, right? So just read through all this stuff, but that's one that gets us stuck a lot and people don't realize is in here, but it's really easy to catch. There's a chart. Tells you right clear as day, but DU tells us as well. That's why we love DU. DU tells us all this stuff, but you guys can see where DU's counting this, right? DU's literally telling you how to count it. Uh, but when you do the 1003, DU will count it for you. Uh, reserves are based on number of pro uh, properties. So remember when DU tells those reserves, that's how it's calculating it. It's going to tell you how to set up the DU. Make sure you uh, set it up properly. Do, do, do. Trust. People like to close and trust. That's a pretty big chapter. Definitely read through that if you're trying to get a trust. It is a little tricky. Just make sure you read it. Uh, all kinds of special stuff here. Uh, counseling is needed for all those specialty programs. So it'll tell you what exact counseling is needed. They do uh, both Fanny and Freddie have a free class uh, for the counseling if it's needed for those specialty uh, first time home buyers and specialty programs. Underwriting borrowers. So this is going through all the DU. How to read DU. Definitely read through that. Let's talk about uh, a couple items on here. Obviously, you'll want to read through all the results. Let's read through the income, though. Obviously, this is where what makes or breaks pretty much every loan. It's always DTI. That's why we love loans that don't have DTI limits. Uh, but when we do it always comes down to income or income and liabilities. Uh, income's typically the problem. Liabilities are a set figure that you either can solve or can't solve. Uh, but income's kind of a, a moving target, right? Uh, and the reason is it has a little bit of subjectiveness, right? A little bit, right? Uh, for the most part, it's all written down here, but there is still, it's telling you, you know, you got to use good judgment, basically, is what it all says. Demonstrate likelihood. And what are they, how do you prove that? They have a bunch of different options. But basically, your underwriter, at the end of the day, your underwriter's making judgment calls here and there on income. That's where we need to be very knowledgeable to know exactly what it says we can and can't do. And when they're exceeding their authority, right, to make assumptions that aren't necessarily true, where we have you know, opposite proof, or we can show in the guidelines that that assumption exceeds where you can, uh, you know, take them down in most cases on the income. Uh, so make sure you read through here. So this is just stable, variable continuity. This is just the way it comes. Then we'll talk about actually, you know, documenting it, right? So make sure you understand this is where kind of all the, uh, the subjective stuff it uh, comes. Demonstrate the likelihood that a consistent level little bit subjective, right? They give you some guides, some charts of what to, what kind of documents they want to see for that, but that's where you can lose your loan. Uh, and that's where you'll push back, right? If you guys come to me and you guys say, Hey, I need help with this condition. And they're telling me, uh, X, but when I look up this, uh, variable income, they're telling me it doesn't qualify, but I have two years. I have overtime on a biweekly. I have this, it fits all these guidelines. How, how, how come the underwriter is not seeing it that way? Uh, and the beauty is they have to, right? So where it's not subjective, they have to follow the guideline. We all do. Same rules for everybody. The underwriter is looking at this exact same page, guys. There is no other page that the underwriter sees. There is no other guide the underwriter gets. The underwriter has to read this exact words that you guys are seeing on this exact page that you guys are seeing and do exactly what Fannie Mae tells them to do. So that's where we get a leg up when we understand this better, or at least can go and, and dissect where we know we're in the right and we can say, okay, so Fanny says, I have variable income. The underwriter is not seeing the way I do. What do I need to do to get this back in action, get this file back approved to get what they need? Oh, I didn't bring two years. I only brought one year. Oh, that's why they denied it at first. But now I know what I need and I can go get it, right? So make sure you you know know enough to go in here. Once you're in here, you're gonna dig in hard, right? You're gonna go line by line, 
bullet by bullet, item by item, and say, why is the underwriter saying one thing? And is there anywhere they might have read two when they meant one or they read an and instead of an or, right? That can blow alone, an and instead of an or. Notice, I'll show you guys where and and or makes a big difference here as we go through these. Huge difference. So uh, make sure you read and and or very clearly. Um, I don't have a specific example, so just make sure you guys read through all this stuff. You know, all these all these bullets have to be checked for variable income. If you guys have variable income in your file and you haven't read every word of this 5, 10, 15 times to know exactly what you need and exactly how to calculate it, you're going to be behind because the underwriter has, right? You need to be just as informed on the file on the, as the underwriter. Continuity, again, pretty easy to have years of continuity, right? So this is pretty easy. There's a chart here, right? Uh, examples uh, with an expiration date without defined expiration date. So we don't need to document these things. We must document three years of alimony. If you can't, if you can't prove in writing via a court document or some other signed document that this spouse is receiving alimony from the other spouse for three more years from note date, uh, I believe it says note date too. Make sure you read in here. Uh, it's going to say that somewhere up here. Uh, from note date, we can't do it, right? That's not acceptable. If it's only uh, two years, six months, can't use it, right? So that's what the underwriter is going to look for. Make sure you have it, right? You have it. You know exactly what you need. You get it. You put it in there. Um, so very important. These are one category. These are another category. Totally different treatment. Oh, I love this one. Guys, I just went over this in the training a minute ago. It, let me, how, it is crystal clear when we need a tax return. Tax returns are required. Let me zoom in on this because a lot of people try to push back on that. Oh, too much. Determining need for tax returns. Tax returns are required if the borrower, any of these items, guys, if it doesn't say and or or, or whatever, it's, it's any, right? So if DU tells you because you typed in W-2 income as the only income that you want to use for this borrower, and that's all DU saw and DU approved you for W-2, no tax returns. But guess what? You are required to read this word to do a loan, right? To be licensed. If you submit that loan as W-2 only, when tax returns are required, you just committed fraud, right? That's that's fraud. That's mortgage fraud. You could lose your license. A lot of bad stuff can happen. Just trying to make things easy, uh, which isn't the wrong idea necessarily to make things easy on your borrower, but we have to follow the guidelines. We have to. So if you try to submit a file without tax returns that requires tax returns, you are part of the problem, right? And it's going to be a problem, trust me. So if they are employed by family members, period, must have tax returns. Two years or one year, right? You can still get one year findings with tax returns, but that means you want, need one year tax returns. There is no such thing as no tax returns. W, you know, We can do a W-2 only with no tax returns, but if any of these boxes are checked, you just did something you weren't supposed to do. Is employed by interested parties. For the property sale. Also, this says two years if you're employed by family members. There is no one year, right? So it's hard for DU to pick that up. DU might give you one year, but it says right here you have to have two years, period, right? Receives rental income from investment. Notice this doesn't say two years. You can get one year findings. I do it all the time for my investors. Uh, as long as I got good credit and stuff, you'll get one year findings, but you must have tax returns to prove the rental income. So that'll trigger, but it won't require two years. If you trigger this, which is hard to code into your loan app, uh, just know that just because DU gave you one year findings, if this is the case, because DU doesn't know this is the case, you're going to need two years no matter what. It says right here, clear as day. You can't miss it, guys. Nobody can miss this. The underwriter's not going to miss this. You guys can't miss this, okay? Uh, so rental income, uh, temporary unemployment, any of that stuff, capital gains, any Schedule Ds type stuff, right? Any of that. Receives income can not be verified by independent knowledgeable source. I don't even know what that is, but if it exists, you got to have two years returns, right? Foreign income, 
Interest and dividend income. That's a B. Tip income. Receives income from any company. If they own any company at all, guys. Read, this one is very key. Read this one close. I'm going to read it. Make sure you understand it. Receives income from sole proprietorship. So if they say they own a company, but they don't own a company, they're still a sole proprietor. They're claiming they own a company. That's a sole proprietor. It's not on paper. LLCs are always going to be on paper and public in the you know state databases. It's going to show up on Fraud Guard as well when we pull fraud. Partnerships, corporations, or any type of business structure which the borrower has 25% or greater interest. Period. No option, right? If the borrower has any LLCs, any ownership of anything, says they own a, are self-employed in any way, we're going to need tax returns. You have to ask for them because they're needed. Borrowers with 25% greater ownership interest are considered self-employed. So again, if they tell you they're self-employed, most likely they fall under this category. So make sure you dig in for those taxes. You can't do W-2 only when they told you they're self-employed. Even if they're just driving Uber on the side, they're still a sole proprietorship, right? Just because someone drives Uber on the side and it's not their main gig, guess what? They're no longer a W-2 only file. You must have two years of tax returns now for that person. Lender must document and underwrite uh, according to self-employed borrowers, which is B32, self-employment income. So now we open up a whole can of worms here, guys. So can't avoid, notice, it would be, uh, I don't want to say illegal, but fraudulent, right? Uh, this, is, this is not the law here, guys. This is a guideline. So this would be a fraudulent. It wouldn't be qualified through the guidelines uh, if we require tax returns. And we try to do it without it, right? So we have to make sure that if they're self-employed, we're going to need tax returns. That's where we love non-QM. Most of the time, these people come in, they think the side gig was a good thing. It makes them side money. That's great. But then they did a bunch of write-offs on the side gig, which then caused it for the conventional calculations to be off. Now we're in non-QM land, which uh, we have the solutions, right? So that's where we're okay. But you got to know where you are to know where you got to go. Right. So make sure you guys read this. There is no if, ands, or buts to providing tax returns for any of these bullets. Very key. Uh, non US citizens, uh, we do some of that. So make sure you guys check that out. Da, da, da. Non taxable. I love this, this little bit here. This comes up more often than you guys would think. This little three, four paragraphs can make or break a file to tax, to gross up 25%, right? Remember we gross up. That's what everybody says to gross up. You must be under all these things. So the big thing is lender must verify that source is non-taxable documentation that can be used includes award letters. that says non-taxable policy agreements that say non-taxable account statements or any other documents. Typically what that means if the income is verified, non-taxable, blah, 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 likely to continue, may develop adjusted gross income, gross up, up 25% up. What that means typically, though, is we must use tax returns to prove this. So to prove that like Social Security benefits are non-taxable, typically the award letter is not going to necessarily notify us of that. So typically, we're going to need tax returns. Many of our retirees uh, that make just enough for Social Security choose not to file tax returns. So although they probably qualify for some non-taxable uh, uh, non income of that or all even of their social security, we cannot gross it up by 25% unless we have the document that's required. So we've got to make sure we read that part, right? Just because we can do it, we got to know exactly why, how, exactly all those uh, little ins and outs. How much time we got? Like 15 minutes? Uh Employment, how do you document employment? This is very important. Pay stubs, W-2s, but it goes beyond that. A whole bunch of stuff here. You could get into the weeds here. It goes pretty deep, right? Uh, when required, right? We just went over when they're required. Uh, all schedules must be included, blah, blah, blah. It tells you exactly what to do. It tells you us we must have a 4506C. Everybody knows that when you're doing loans, right? That's part of the package, part of the underwriting because 
it's right here. And non-QM loans require that as well, if we're using income. Uh, documentation by the bar tells us how to fill out the VO, uh, VOE. Uh, Third-party vendor tells us what vendors we can use. Fannie Mae Day One, we love Fannie Mae Day One, right? Fannie Mae Day One vendors uh, give us a guarantee, right? They give us a report that's 100% uh, guaranteed, uh, like the work number, uh, like we use account check here at uh, at the mortgage calculator. So those are great. Here is base pay. How do we calculate base pay? How do we verify base pay? Blah blah blah. Income calculation guides. We could spend days on this, guys. Make sure you read through this. There's all kinds of cool calculators that we have in the Knowledge Center for our team where it does all this for you so you don't have to worry too much about it. Military is super tough. If you guys are doing uh, uh, going through LES, whew, those are uh, a little complicated sometimes. Make sure you understand those. There's some uh, good guides on that as well. Commission income, a whole chapter on this. How you document commission must have two years. Everybody should know that just because someone makes commission doesn't mean we can document it and use it, right? Uh, especially people that have like yearly bonuses and yearly commissions and things like that too. Those are difficult uh, because it might not have occurred yet this year. Second jobs must have a second job for two years. Just because you got a second job this year doesn't mean you can have two jobs and use them, right? Minimum of two years history of secondary income. So if you're trying to use two full-time jobs, you must have had two full-time jobs for two years in order to use two full-time jobs. If you've only had one for a short amount of time, no problem. We can use one of those jobs income, your main job that you've had for two years, but not both, right? So make sure that you know when you can and can't use two jobs. 456C, verbal VOE, we know how to do that, all of us. Rental income, this one's huge. It's a big chapter, guys. We dig into this all the time. So eligible properties tells you when we can use rental income, when we can't use rental income, how we document rental income, which is 1040 Schedule E. Remember, when there's rental income, we must have tax returns. So how do we document it and how do we calculate it? We get the tax returns. Our calculators, we have a whole episodes on that too, guys. So don't worry about calculating it. We'll go through that in detail. Um, on subject, this gets you stuck sometimes, documenting rental income from subject. So if you're buying an investment property, notice what they're going to use. Non-QM is a little different too. Non-QM, we make some exceptions here. Uh, but what, you know, 1007 or, or uh, 1025 if we use it, or, and copies of lease agreements, or, and, or, and, or. This is where and and or gets tricky, right? And, 1007, and lease 1007 1025 and either this or this not both right either and this or this so it means bullet one or bullet two and an or get really tricky here guys in the guidelines so make sure you understand the difference between those um this one, the, we have tons of trainings on all this stuff we can go through, you guys. Yeah, tons and tons. This is a deep chapter. That's where we excel. We love to teach you guys on that. We won't take the time here. Uh, we don't got much time here. Um, remember, I would use all of our calculators to calculate this income. So 1040, it's going to tell you everything on a 1040, how to do that, which our calculators do quickly. Then the Schedule C is going to tell you how to go through that. Uh, I would use our calculator, right? The calculator shows you. Schedule D. Uh, I think Fannie Mae even links to a calculator on one of these chapters of their calculator, but we have much better calculators in our thing. Uh, Schedule E, this is where the rental income comes from and the royalty income, which is different. So remember when you're using the calculator, there's one calculator for Schedule E royalty, one calculator for Schedule E rental, totally different calculators. Schedule F, nobody has that. That's a farm. So, <laughs> Real quick, I think one thing to spend a couple of minutes on would be the rental income just because we work with so many investors. So do you want to go through the little rental income section? Um, well, I mean, it was this whole uh, section of uh, – it wasn't just this. That that one paragraph is, is part of it. That's where you get it from the Schedule E. Um, and it tells you which categories, but that's where the um, – 
the calculators will actually uh, do it. And there is a, a Fannie Mae 1084 calculator uh, where it does it for you. But it's telling us which expenses we have to hit them for and which we don't. But again, just use the calculator. Everybody uses the calculator because those are the actual categories on the return that make up these expenses that they're highlighting here. So I definitely use the calculator. Don't try to read this because uh, you'll get lost there. Um, the actual calculation, though, Kyle, was up here in the rental income where it was really big, right? So this is where we actually calculate it. So I don't want to, uh, this will take hours, you know, to go through. So we won't want, we don't want to actually do this uh, whole thing. But uh, uh, I skipped through it. Let me see, where were we? Uh, partnerships, again, calculator, calculator, calculator on all the different types of return. Remember, S Corp is different than C Corp or regular Corp. Very different, very different rules. Make sure you read this, very different. If you find someone with a C Corp, like an INC, that's not an S Corp, make sure you read through it because they're very different, okay? You really only need this if they're 100% owner is what it will say here, 100%, uh, right? So a, a, a corporation, a C Corp, only if they own 100%, which not many people, nobody would own a C Corp to own 100%. So this will rarely come into play. So be careful with C-Corp. C-Corp is not S-Corp. P&L statements. You do have to have P&L statements with uh, with self-employment. Rental property in DU tells you how to set that up. That's a good little chapter. Reserve requirements, definitely good. But again, DU pops that number out, so you don't have to worry too much about that. Uh, IPCs, ha <laughs> this gets people stuck. Very simple guys, there's a chart here. You should never get stuck. Look at this, IPC limits. Uh, IPC, well, first off, it tells you what an IPC is, interested party contribution. Uh, IPC uh, is from any party to the borrower, any third party organization. So, you know, realtor, uh, title company, lender credits, Anybody involved in that transaction, seller credits, anybody, right? We can't exceed. So remember, very strict on investment properties. Only non-QM will allow us to ex exceed this. 2% your limit. I got caught with that, right? I had to give uh, undo a seller credit before because the seller credit was more than 2%. I can catch you quicker than you think. Uh, principal, primary, or second homes, we have a little bit more. Remember, it's 3%. This is where most people, most people use conventional prime uh, primary for 90% or greater LTV, like, you know, 90 plus percent of our loans are at this LTV. So we're at the three, not the six. Only uh, uh, FHA allows the six at the high LTVs, but we do have an IPC of six when we go down to the regular amounts and then even a nine here. So remember you guys know these IPC limits. Lender checklist for IPCs, this is good. Uh, lender incentives, like when we pay lenders, I mean, when we pay as incentive, they have to, uh, document that mm -hmm. types, uh, DPAs. Oh, this is good too. Undisclosed IPCs. What they mean there guys, seller financing. You get these schemer, uh, schemer fix and flip, uh, uh investor, uh, type people that want to use a conventional loan and then get a seller or silent second, they'll say. There's no such thing, guys. Undisclosed IPCs are illegal. Well, not I don't want to say illegal. Uh, fraudulent if you deliver it to Fannie Mae, right? It's mortgage fraud, which is illegal. <laughs> so, so it is technically, right? So don't be involved in this. Uh, don't let someone that's trying to do the investor move of doing some kind of weird flicks and flip or get some extra financing uh, on the side, there is no such thing, right? And if you try to do that with any loan, you know, it'll blow up, right? Won't be good. Uh, so definitely go non-QM if that's the case. If they want to do a fix and flip, let's go non-QM. Let's get them the fix and flip. Let's get them the financing. Let's get them approved for any uh, IPCs that exceed the amounts that are, are needed. And stay away from doing some fraudulent stuff here with Fannie Mae. Uh, DPA is IPC. Remember, DPA can't exceed those limits that you saw there. Guess what? That's why you don't do conventional DPA because you can't get three and a half percent. Look at the math, guys. If you want three and a, or uh, you know the three percent or whatever, it doesn't really. Oh shoot, I lost the thing. So all the DPA programs that we do, 
99% of the DPA that everybody does is going to be on FHA, not conventional. But of course you could do it. A lot of uh, like local city ones won't be like the full DPA, right? It'll be like a 1% credit or something like that for like a city type of one. Uh, financing concessions. Good to know. These are types of financing. Sales concessions, probably the most common, you know, seller credits. Interest rate buy downs. There are rules on the two one buy down type stuff that everybody's doing. Make sure you understand those. Uh, that's not really pickable. All right. Verification of deposits. This tricks people up. It's written here clear as day, guys. Shouldn't have to get tripped up on uh, what we need to verify, right? Tells you exactly what, tells you exactly how, tells you exactly what to do. It tells you exactly what the bank statement has to be looked at, how old the bank statement has to be, all that kind of stuff. Da, 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 da. Tells you what to do with stocks and bonds, tells you what to do with retirement, tells you what to do with trust, tells you about gifts, gifts of equity. People don't realize this is a great tool. Make sure you understand gifts of equity. A gift of equity is when the seller is usually related, right? Think of a, a, a parent selling a home to a um, uh, you know child. So if uh, they want to gift the home to them, their gift of equity uh, is uh, usually used for the down payment. So there are limits though. Remember, if we do a gift of equity, we're going to usually have an LTV limit. So typically that gift has to be a pretty hefty gift. The last couple I structured were like a 20% down payment was the gift, right? Because we have an LTV limit. So make sure you check into those uh, and document it properly. Uh, but these are great opportunities for people that are interested parties to exceed what would otherwise be it. IPC that we just saw there in the last uh, little demo. I think we're about out of time. Let me see if I find any more, Kyle. Bridge loans, eh, probably not. I need to go through that. But if you do get stuck, guess what? You're just gonna type it in and pop right up. Cash on hand. All right, so yeah, this is a good one. Can I use cash? Well, um, no, but here's what it says. Uh, cash on hand is not acceptable use of down payment or closing costs. For home ready, cash may be served. See chapter, specific chapter. So just because there's a specific chapter, you got to read that, go through all the guidelines. So some people say, oh, it is possible, right? Just because it says, right? But yeah, nah, I would stay away from that, right? We got to document it. There's a whole chapter on how to document it. They're not just going to throw that out the window if someone says they have cash. Da, da, da. Ah, this is good too. I like this one. Uh, if the uh, real estate is their own agent, if they're their own agent, can they use the down payment or whatever, the you know their commissions as funds? And they can. They must get a settlement statement. So I've done that on a few deals. Love to do that for actually for our, our MLOs on the team that were also uh, the realtor and uh, not the MLO because I was doing it for them, right? As their you know team leader. Um, but yeah, very interesting there. Mm -hmm. Credit scores, big one. Credit, credit, credit. Could go all day on credit. Number and age of accounts. That's the only one I probably want to go through. Everything else is going to be super deep. But remember, this is when we must have trade lines and stuff, right? So they must have a credit history. And there really is no number here. When we go non-QM, they'll put a number. Because guess what? DU is going to tell us all these numbers, right? Uh, DU is going to tell us what, um, you know, what, what they will need, what they don't need, if they qualify or not, sometimes it'll just say no. Right. And that's usually because they only have one account or two accounts or whatever. Uh, we can fix that though. That's why we love to come in and do our simulators. Definitely do the simulators, add, uh, authorized users, a way to instantly get someone some credit history. If they're short on that, if that's what DU is complaining about is the length of credit. We can solve that sometimes if they have, you know, family members or uh, something or a spouse that has a car, they can add them, you know, even on the same deal, right? One pulls high, one pulls low, but the one with the high has a good card, just add it to the one that's low and you might fix the problem, right? So there are ways to fix these things. You got to understand what to use looking at. 
It's not going to tell you exactly what DU is doing. This is where DU is a little vague, right? She's going to say, hey, we want to determine that they're good at credit. It's not going to tell you what you want. A non-QM lender is going to say, we need two trade lines for two years, and one trade line has to be a mortgage, period, right? And you have to go boom, 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 and check those boxes. A little bit vague here because they are referring to DU essentially here, right? The automated system. Mortgage history, make sure you do that. Authorized user of a credit. Uh, I just talked about that. If you're going to try to use that as one of your, um, you know, rescore things that can improve credit, make sure you understand what it needs, what it doesn't need. Da, da, da. Debt to income ratios. Obviously, that's where the meat and potatoes is. That's where everything happens. This is manual. Don't listen to this, right? This is DU. 50 can't be 50 though it has to be 49.99 or whatever 49.98 whatever it is um if you hit 50 it's not gonna work so uh just know that when people say the dti that's for manual we don't really do manuals uh, but it's gonna tell you a little bit about how to calculate it's important to understand what du is doing du is gonna spit out a number if you don't know what du is doing you're gonna be lost right so make sure you understand what du is doing so you can understand why you're not getting the number that you want and you think you're supposed to get, and you can figure out exactly why do you use putting it where it's not supposed to go or putting it where it is supposed to go, and you put you know it wrong on the 10 or 3 most of the time. Uh, da, 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 re-underwriting. Hopefully that doesn't happen. <laughs> Obligations. Uh, that's important. Make sure if you guys are trying to exclude stuff, you understand what you can and can't exclude and why. This is a pretty big chapter here because this is like the whole, uh, you know, everything of what you can and can't do and what these debts are. There's other types of debts like alimony that have to be accounted for that aren't going to show up on credit. Uh, sometimes they do if they're through the state, but, you know, most of the time these things don't. And if you do a loan and that exists and it pops up later, you know, you're kind of part of the fraud and not part of the solution, right? So you got to dig here, guys. These are the kinds of things that might pop up later that we need to make sure we dig on. Um Let's see the one thing, uh, debts paid by others. This is the one that people go for a lot, especially a lot of our investors. So we use this a lot. So I'm going to go over this one. So let's click here. Debts paid by others. Certain debts can be excluded from the DTI, which helps a lot of our investors. When a borrower is obligated on a non-mortgage debt, but not the party who is actually repaying the debt, the lender may exclude the monthly payment. From the monthly obligations. This policy applies whether or not the party is obligated on the debt. So co-signing on a car, right? You co-sign on a car, we can get that excluded. Installment loans, student loans, revolving, lease payments, etc. See below of how to exclude it. Or when a borrower is on a mortgage debt, but it's not the party who's actually repaying the debt, we may exclude the full PITIA if the party making the payments is obligated. There are no delinquencies into a month and the borrower is not using rental income. What does that mean for our investors? LLC, right? All my properties that I own for rental properties, I have the loan in an LLC. I have a non-QM DSCR loan. Uh, you know, I have a bunch of them. We, we, you know, do like we preach here, guys. So when I do my conventional loans, I'm able to exclude those uh, because those loans are in my LLC name and the LLC is making the payments and I don't miss any payments. Right, so I exclude those from my personal because I own the property in LLC and I do a TSCR loan that is to an LLC. And but in order to exclude this, remember, guys, read the whole chapter. We must, the lender must obtain twelve months canceled checks or bank statements from the other party making the payments to document twelve month payment history with no delinquent, no exception, just because it's in someone else's name. We still need 12 months. 12 means 12. 12 doesn't mean 11. 12 doesn't mean 10. 12 means 12. If the loan is new, they've only made 10 payments, guess what? Doesn't count, right? We're going to have to eat it. So make sure that we check that. When a borrower is obligated on mortgage debt, whether or not the other party making payments, the reference property must be counted in the finance property. So there's a little tricky one there too, though. So even though they're going to exclude the debt, they're still going to hit you with, we're not going to give you another loan if you're an investor that's maxed out your number of loans. So this is this is tricky, guys. This little chapter here uh, is tricky. I use it a lot, uh, but it's also tricky to use. So make sure you use it um, you know, to your advantage and use it properly.
those are all the different types too, by the way, student loans, all these other ones. Those first ones are usually the ones. Uh, da, da, da. Underwriting the property, we're pretty much done here, but make sure you go in and understand what they're looking at when they're looking at your appraisal. A lot of people get the appraisal back and they're like, it wasn't as is, what's, what's the problem? Well, it tells you right here what the problem is, right? Just because it's, just, there is no rule that says, you know, if the box is checked as is, you just take it, right? Look at this, guys. There's dozens and dozens and dozens of rules. So one box doesn't cut it, right? You got to you gotta read the whole thing, uh, understand what they're doing, understand just because it's as is doesn't mean uh, that uh, we'll see where the uh, condition and quality, right? A lot of subjective stuff in here, right? Read through all this. Uh, the one thing I want to actually go over, though, before Kyle kicks me off, is I believe there was the ineligible, yeah, or uh, ineligible projects. So this is non-warrantable, right? So ineligible project aka non-warrantable condo but this is where uh you know not that we want people to pay more but if you have a non-warrantable condo it's non-warrantable and it it's clear as day it's ineligible right so it's ineligible fannie mae that's where we love to give our non-qm options so we have a ton of non-qm options for non-warrantable so again we have to know what we have to know what we have on the other end right so you got to know what fannie mae says is non-warrantable to understand why we're doing non-warrantable non-qm deals right so make sure you read through this. It's very, uh, very detailed, right? So there's a lot of different things that can make it ineligible. A lot. Timeshares, right? Uh, also, tell, these are the, if it's a co-op, this throws it out of whack. If it's a condo, this throws it ineligible, right? Any of these are ineligible. This is only for co-ops, though, right? So there's different checkboxes for each. So make sure you run through this if you think you're in trouble. Condo tells. Right, they don't exist for Fannie or Freddie or anything conventional. That's where we love to help out with our non-QM action. So we have plenty of condo tell non-warrantable condo options. So you got to know what that means and why anybody won't qualify conventional. And that's where we attack with our non-QM because that's where we specialize. Right. So you got to know what you have to know what to do. So a lot of different things: commercial, mixed use, all the things that throw you out of whack, live work. All those kinds of things uh, end up messing with your uh, condos. And then limited review, full review. Make sure you understand the difference, right? Full review. Uh, there's the questionnaire should be linked in there as well. I'm not going to click into it since we're pretty much done. <laughs> PUD. Remember PUD, planned uh, urban development. That's anything with an HOA. Just because it doesn't have a condo, it's not a condo. Uh, doesn't mean it's not a PUD. So PUD still has requirements, right? You're still going to need uh, to make sure that the PUD is good, make sure that they have insurance, all that kind of good stuff, right? And that's pretty much it. This is all unique stuff, right? These are the specialty programs. So if you're doing a specialty program, you definitely got to dig in here, but those are only specialties. So that's it, guys. We went through, almost read, you know, the, the good stuff. If you guys spend, uh, you know, I read this all in one night, right? You just got to skim through this, guys. It's like five paragraphs per bullet. There's, you know, hundreds of bullets, but it's really a skim thing, right? It's bullets. It's little quick guides, little quick charts. This isn't super complicated stuff. Uh, so I definitely challenge everybody to not necessarily print it, uh, save paper, right? Go, go online, uh, download the PDF skim through it you should be familiar with every section at least in general to know where to find it right and once you read through it and you've skimmed through it then this becomes so much easier because you know what you're looking for right there is no such thing as non-warrantable condo right in in here right it's in eligible project right so if you don't know uh how how it's worded you're gonna have trouble finding your query so again, you got to know what you have to know what you don't have or to know what to find or what to look for. So don't be afraid to dig in and, and read all this if you haven't yet. If you haven't read this, I wouldn't call myself uh, you know, a full-time loan officer if I haven't read the guide in full, right? You got to read the guide. That's where every loan starts. That's our 
our starting point. Uh, you know, that's our, our everything, right? So we're always going to uh, quote this, you know, it's our Bible, quote it like scripture, right? You're going to quote, literally quote it because you're going to be talking to an underwriter. They're going to say, hey, that section, you're going to hold on. I remember that section. You're going to come here. You're going to type it in and say, why are they saying that's ineligible? I remember that section. And I remember that part about live work. And I remember that. And boom, now you just won the argument. You saved the loan and you're a rock star, right? So you got to know a little bit. Don't worry about the nitty gritty. Don't worry about memorizing it. Uh, but every time you read it, it will become more and more familiar. Pretty soon you'll be able to quote it like scripture, but you don't have to. We have the internet these days. It takes you 10 seconds. So don't worry about that stuff. I think the main thing is the search bar, right? And there is a question here. Uh, April was asking, uh, do you ever use open AI to help with finding the answers? Not in this case, we're using guidelines, right? The only place to find the answers in our business is the actual guidelines, whether that's the Fannie or Freddie guidelines or the individual guidelines of the actual investor or lender that we're taking the loan to. So this should be bookmarked on your computer, that link, and you should have that search bar ready to pull up at any time. But with that being said, we went a little bit over, but that was great. Tomorrow, we're going to talk about the uh, Freddie Mac uh, selling guide and guidelines as well. So that'll be good. Make sure you tune into that. These are the two basics of what we do every day. First stop always as a loan officer uh, is always going to be there. So thank you, everybody, for tuning in. We appreciate it. Thanks for going through the presentation, Nick. We will see everybody tomorrow, Wednesday at 7 p.m. Eastern. We do this show every Tuesday and Wednesday night, uh, 7 p.m. Eastern. So we'll see you for the next one. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.